Good day and welcome to Books of the Wise. Today we will be looking at the 25 different types of figures of speech in the Bible. Now, if you are like me, you probably didn't even know that there existed 25 types of figures of speech in the English language or in any language for that matter. But there does exist and today we'll be looking at that in the Bible with examples. We'll also be looking at why the Bible makes use of figures of speech and how to spot a figure of speech in the Bible. And we will be using this great book, Roy B. Zuck's book, Basic Bible Interpretation, Chapter 7, Figures of Speech, because I didn't even know that this existed. And that's why we have great men who wrote books that we can read and that we can use. And I've play, I'll place a link to this book in the description box below so that you can check it out for yourself. But now, without further ado, let's look at the, at the 25 figures of speech in the Bible from Roy B. Zuck's book. Now, now, first of all, why does the biblical authors make use of figures of speech? Five reasons can be given. First of all, it attracts attention. For example, James chapter 3, verse 6. The tongue is a fire. Whoa, that attracts your attention, right? It's much, it grabs your attention much more than just saying the tongue is dangerous. The, tongue, the little tongue is a fire that can set a whole forest ablaze. Secondly, it makes concrete. For example, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, God's everlasting arms. You, 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 you take this abstract concept of God's protection and God's fatherly love, but you don't just say it like that. You say God's arms, His everlasting arms. It's always there to protect you. It makes this abstract concept very concrete. Thirdly, it helps with retention, memory, right? For example, Matthew 23, verse 27, when Jesus told the Pharisees, Pharisees are like a whitewashed tomb, right? You'll remember that. They'll remember it. The readers will remember it, right? Below, they're just dead bones, but on the top, they're like this pretty whitewashed tomb. Jesus um, showing the, uh, and describing their hypocrisy, but making sure it sticks in their minds. Fourth, it abbreviates an idea. It takes a long concept, uh, and with a few words, you explain this concept. For example, Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, right? Immediately you think of a shepherd and you think of God and you think, wow, that means God provides, he takes care of me, he leads me, uh, he's good, um, he protects, all of that in just a, a single phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. And then fifth, it encourages reflection. For example, Psalm 50, 52 verse 8, but I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. Immediately you're thinking, in what ways am I like an olive tree flourishing? So you, you can't just read over that quickly. You, you have to pause and think. Uh, so it encourages that reflection. Next, let's look at how to know if an expression is figurative. Okay, So, so here's the overall arching rule. Always take a passage to be literal unless there is good reason for doing otherwise. Okay, so... Not everything in the Bible is, um, sorry, is, sorry about that. So not everything in the Bible is figurative, even though we are discussing um, the figurative language now. Don't now go overboard and just think everything is, is figurative. For example, um, there's no good reason to believe that the 144,000 Jews that will be saved in Revelation 7 verse 4 to 8 is not a literal number. Now, not everyone agrees with this interpretation, um, but if you read Revelation 7, verse 4 to 8, it says 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from each tribe in Israel will turn back to the Lord. So, yes, the book of Revelation has a lot of symbolic language, but it, we shouldn't just take everything as figuratively. So, the overarching principle is take everything literally unless there's clear reason to believe otherwise. And now, I'm going to give you a quick five reasons uh, for five times when it's clearly figurative language and you know it's figurative language. So first of all, the figurative is intended if the literal would involve an impossibility. For example, Jeremiah 1 verse 18, God made Jeremiah an iron pillar and a bronze wall. That's obviously figurative language. There's no way Jeremiah could literally be made an iron pillar and a bronze wall. Uh, also, if the literal would be an absurdity, then you know it's figurative language. For example, Isaiah 55 verse 12, 
trees clap their hands and mountains jump, right? That that is an absurdity, and, and therefore you know it figurative language. Fourthly, uh, if the literal would involve immoral action, then you know it's figurative language and not literal. For example, John 6, verse 53 to 58, Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus didn't uh, promote cannibalism there. No, Jesus meant take me, eat of me, uh, believe in me, receive me, and you will have life. The context of is the people wanting just food for their stomach, Jesus, to multiply bread again. And then also, how do you know something is figurative? When it is followed by a literal explanation. So it's a figurative uh, saying, but then a literal explanation is followed. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 15, uh, the word fall asleep, is it now literally falling asleep or what? Well, that's followed by those who died in the same context. And so you know those who died equals those who have fallen asleep. And so those who fall asleep is figuratively saying, referring to those who died. Okay, and the context is also obviously of those who mourn, right? Also, Ephesians 2 verse 1, they were dead. So is it literally dead or figuratively dead? Well, it's followed by the phrase, in their transgressions. And so you know um, that defines they were dead and explains it for us. It, it's a figurative dead in your sins, in your serious bosses. And then the last way that you know something is figuratively um, and not literal is when it is marked by a qualifying adjective or prepositional phrase. For example, Mark 6 verse 14, it describes God as our heavenly father. Now that's figurative, right? Because heavenly describes father. Now, we also know in other passages, right, where just father is used. But so heavenly helps us to understand this is figuratively. God is acting like a father towards us, loving, protecting, caring. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4, living stone. So is that stone literal or figurative? Well, it's Figurative, because living describes it. We know stones aren't living, but that's the way that it describes it, showing it's figurative, vibrant, active stones. Um, the recipients there. Then Ephesians 6 verse 17, the sword, is it literal sword? No, the sword of the spirit. Now we know it's figurative, right? It's symbolic. First Timothy 6 verse 12, fight the good fight. Oh, should, should, should we all go just and fight everyone? Of the faith, of the faith. Now you know, oh, it's figuratively spoken of. Okay, so that's how you know that a figure is, uh, a statement uh, or an expression is figurative. Now let's look next at um, this question before we look at those 25 uh, types of figures of speech in the Bible. What about the literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation? Um, isn't that something that we should give our lives for, the literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation? Literal. Well, with literal... Interestingly, the Antiochian fathers who held to this, right, and who stood for this, uh, left space for figurative language. So see our video on the history of Bible interpretation, also from uh, Rabbi Zach's book, chapter 2. Um, so the Antiochian fathers, to learn about them. But Mounts, a uh, more modern scholar, said, an interpretation is literal only when it corresponds to what the author intends to convey with his statement. In other words, um, if he wants to convey a figurative meaning, then the literal interpretation is that figurative meaning. Okay, so literal doesn't just mean nothing is figurative. Literal can and leaves space for figurative, as long as what the author is has meant is conveyed. And therefore I, uh, whenever I, there's something like me, M-E, capital, it's me saying this and my thoughts and not necessarily Robbie Zak or another author. I like the phrase authorial intent, authorial intent more than literal, grammatical, historical, okay? Because authorial intent is very clear. It, it takes away that, that word literal, um, because literal, yeah, but we can we leave space for figurative, for symbolic as well. It contains all three of the aspects of literal, grammatical, and historical, authorial intent, what did the author then mean? And it also encourages further thought to discover more than just meaning, but the intent the author's intent, not just what the author said, but what the author meant and why he said that, the purpose in what he wrote. And that's, that's why I, I stay, stand, uh, yes, I hold to literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation, but I rather, I think it's more clear and more helpful to say, I believe when studying scripture, you need to find the authorial intent before you try to apply it to your life. 
Okay, now let's look at those 25 types of figures of speech in the Bible. Um, first of all, there are three figures of speech involving comparison. The first one is a simile. That's the most common one. The definition of a simile, one thing is explicitly compared to another using as or like. For example, in 1 Peter 2 verse 24, it says, all men are like grass, showing like you all men, our lives are, are fading away quickly. Um, Psalm 1 verse 3, uh, the righteous person, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Okay, uh, his leaves doesn't wither, he bears fruit in season. But in contrast, uh, the unrighteous, he's like Jeff that the wind blows away. Like, note that the word like. Um, and so the challenge for the interpreter is to say, how are these two things the same? How is a tree planted by streams of water like the believer? So that's always a question that you have to ask when trying to interpret a simile. The next one is a metaphor. Another uh, figure of speech involving comparison is a metaphor. A metaphor, is a, the definition of that is two things are compared without the use of as or like, without that. Okay? For example, Isaiah 40 verse 6, all flesh is grass. So in 1 Peter 2 verse 24, with a simile we had, all men are like grass, now all flesh is grass. So it brings that uh, comparison without the word as or like. And for example, John 10 verse 7, I am the gate. Jesus didn't say, I am like a gate. He said, I am the gate of the sheep. The only way to find life, uh, to find safety in the sheepfold is through me. And according to me, the comparison is more intense with a metaphor than with a simile. Okay, if you say all men are like grass, yeah, okay, there's a comparison, but all flesh are grass. So yeah, that, that comparison, it's, it's tighter. Um, it, it's more intense. Um, third, the third type of figure of speech, and this is one that I've never heard of before reading this great book, is a hypo catastasis hypocatastasis and this is the definition is the likeness is implied by a direct naming the third figure of speech involving comparison the likeness is implied by a direct naming for example john 1 verse 29 john the baptist called jesus the lamb of god so immediately he's comparing jesus with a lamb in what ways maybe you can say he's meek Sacrificial, think of the Old Testament system. He will give his life uh, as a ransom for others. So he's blameless. So John is comparing Jesus by calling him something, by direct naming. Another one uh, where John um, called the Sadducees, you brood of vipers, like you snakes, um, giving the idea they are evil, they are from the devil's offspring. Uh, thinking back of Genesis 3 verse 15 with the snake, um, uh, the, the devil took the form of a snake. Okay, so you are that offspring of the snake. So these, the first three that I shared now was uh, figures of speech involving comparison. Now the next nine figures of speech involve substitution. One word for another, or one group of words for another group of words. The first one there is metonymy, metonymy. Now the definition of metonymy is the substitution of one word for another. The substitution of one word for another. For example, in modern English, we have the pen is mightier than the sword. What is actually mean? The, wo the word pen was there substituted for the word written words, right? Written words. Um, ink, um, wh what you write. So it's not literally a pen that's mightier than a sword, but it's what you write that's mightier than a sword. You can cause more harm. Or the White House. Uh, the White House is metonymy. You're, it's, you're substituting like the president's dwelling place, right? And the cabinet there. Um, so that's a, another a modern example of metonymy. In the Bible, Proverbs 12 verse 18, the tongue of the wise bring healing. It's not really the tongue. It's what? The words of the wise that bring healing. Um, the tongue of the unrighteous is like so, sword thrashes, right? It's not really their tongue. It's still words. So the tongue is their substituted um, the, the words are there substituted. The words is substituted for the word tongue. Then the next uh, figure of speech is one that, once again, I've never heard of. Synoctiki. Synoc synecdoche. I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Okay, this is the definition of this is substituting a part for the whole or vice versa. The, the whole for a part, okay? Of a, uh, for example, Luke 2 is one. 
Augustus census uh, should be taken of all the world. All the world? No, obviously not everyone, but lots of people. The, maybe his known world. So um, the all the world is uh, substituted. Um, so most, lots of people substituted for all the world. That's an, an example of that. Uh, or Proverbs 1 verse 16, the other way around. Their feet rush into sin. So it's actually not just your feet. It's all of you, right? That rush into sin. But your feet is there substituted for all of you. Um, okay, and then another type of figure of speech is merism. Merism. Okay, this is when the whole is substituted by two contrasting parts. Two contrasting parts. For example, almost like a mirror, right? A merism, right? So two contrasting parts. This part, you look in the mirror and then you see the contrast of you or the reflection of you, right? For example, in Psalm 139 verse 2, you know when I sit and when I rise. So two contrasting parts, sit and rise. But what is meant is really and everything in between. The whole is substituted by the two contrasting parts. Um, for example, also God said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, what about the middle? What about, okay, yes, and everything in between. The two contrasting parts stands, is substituted here for the whole. Okay, then the next one is hendiadas. Also never heard of this before. Greek word hen means one, dia means by means of, das means two. So the concept of one concept communicated by two joint words, by and in which one of the element defines the other. For example, Genesis 3 verse 16. Now you really need to read this in a more literal translation, not like in a paraphrase translation. Genesis 3 verse 16, it actually says, uh, God said, I will increase your pain to Eve, right? God said to Eve, I will increase your pain and childbearing. But what does our modern translations do? It translates it as pain in childbearing because God's not going to increase your pain, the curse, right? You're going to have more pain and more children. No, uh, God's going to increase your pain in childbearing. So uh, one concept, pain in childbearing, is stated in uh, two words with an and in between, pain and childbearing. Another one, Philippians 2 verse 17, the service and sacrifice. Translated as the sacrificial service. And Acts 1 verse 25, the ministry and apostleship. And Nash be translated woodenly, just like that, but more modern and uh, dynamic translations, which, which uh, translated as apostolic ministry. One concept said in two words with an and in between, hendidas. Now, many times the translators understanding hendidas would translate its figurative meaning, and so we don't know if of this figure of speech, but some more literal translations like Nasby would keep it, and the reader would have to know of this figure of speech so as to not get confused. Now, the next um, figure of speech involving uh, substitution is euphemism. Euphemism. The definition of euphemism is substituting an offensive term with an inoffensive term. For example, death um, is, um, is um, in the Bible, I, I, the word used in Acts 7 verse 60 is sleep. In Genesis 35 verse 18, it's soul going out. In Genesis 49 verse 29, being gathered to his people. In Job 23 verse 14, goes the way of the earth. In Psalm 39 verse 14, going and will be no more. So instead of saying death, they're using these euphemisms, these softer, less offensive ways of saying the same thing, of saying death. I remember um, Jesus spoke of Lazarus and said Lazarus slept. And his disciples didn't understand it. It was just a euphemism. And they said, well, if you sleep, you'll awake again. Jesus said, no, he died. Uh, when they didn't catch on to the figure of speech, the euphemism there. Another one is going to the toilet, right? Is uh, often uh, in the Bible, it's um, euphemistically stated. For example, Elijah in 1 Kings 18 verse 27, we uh, taunted uh, the Baal prophets and saying, maybe Baal, you know, went to the toilet. He's using, he used a euphemism there. E Eglon in Judges 3 verse 24, um, when he went to the toilet and... Um, uh, the people thought he went to the toilet, but he was actually killed. Um, Judges 3 verse 24, he was covering his feet, right? Actually, he went to the toilet. Same with Saul in the cave, right? He was relieving himself in 1 Samuel 24 verse 4, uh, when David could have killed him. Or 
maybe covered his feet, whatever euphemism the English translator would maybe bring across. Um, would they bring across the, the euphemism or substitute that with a modern euphemism? Or would they say it just like it is trying to explain the figure of speech to maybe those who wouldn't understand? So that's a euphemism. A next figure of speech um, involving substitution is personification. The definition of personification is when you ascribe human characteristics or actions to inanimate objects, ideas, or animals. Okay? So, for example, Isaiah 35 is one. The desert and the parched land will be glad. Right? So, the desert will be glad. Will they, like, be happy? Isaiah 55 is 12. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. So, mountain singing... Trees clapping hands, that's personification. Just trying to show the, the gladness and how amazing that will be. Um, so, But it's obviously figurative of language. Then the next one, oh, yeah, another one, Romans 6 verse 9, death no longer rules over Christ. It's almost like death is being personified here as if death could take the action, can, can rule, can be like a king and a master. But that day, um, or Romans 6 verse 9 says, that no longer uh, is taking place. Then, uh, a next uh, figure of speech involving substitution is apostrophe. Apostrophe is the direct address to an object as if it were a person or to an absent imaginary person as if he or she were present. Okay, so it's almost like personification, but it's direct address. Okay, and the second part of that is talking to someone as if he was right here next to you. Okay, so for example, Psalm 114 verse 5, why was it O.C.? That you fled? So it's almost like, you think of apostrophe like direct speech, right? Apostrophe. You're directly speaking to the sea. You're personifying the sea while directly speaking to it. Why was it, O sea, that you fled? So that you're speaking to the sea and you're saying it ran away. Micah 1 verse 2. Listen, O earth. As if the earth has ears. So obviously he's referring to the people on the earth. That's what the figurative language means there. And then Psalm 6 verse 8, the second type of apostrophe, is speaking to someone that's, that can't even hear you as if he was present. Away from me, all you who do evil. Right? Those people are far away. They can't hear you. Maybe he's in his bedroom. But he's speaking as if they can hear him. Almost speaking to himself to, to, try, to tell himself he doesn't want anything to do with evil people. Then the next figure of speech involving substitution is anthropomorphism. Now, this, the, the definition of this is the ascribing of human characteristics or actions to God. For example, uh, anthropos in Greek means man, morph means form, and so uh, it's, the, it's almost like saying it takes the form of God, okay? Um, for example, Psalm 8 verse 3, when I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man? So, does God have fingers? Um, no, God is spirit. John 4 tells us God is spirit. So God doesn't have fingers. It's ascribing human characteristics or actions to God. Um, Psalm 31 verse 2. Incline your ear. Incline your ear. Um, a young little translation, a, a more modern translation like the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Listen closely. But even that is anthropomorphism. Ascribing a human action to God. So human characteristic like an ear or a human action to God. That's anthropomorphism. Um, trying to make God relatable or describing God in ways that we would understand him because the Bible was written for man, right? And so that's a figure of language. And God doesn't just have an ear, but it's for us to understand God. God does hear, though. Um, Second Chronicles 16 verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth. Does God have eyes like we have eyes? No. But he sees and he, he understands us and he sees us. And so it's ascribing a, a human characteristic to God so that we could understand it figuratively, right? Then the next one is a little bit of a more tricky one, anthropopathism. Anthropopathism. This is ascribing human emotions to God. For an anthropos, once again, man, path, pathos, emotions. Um, for example, Zechariah is one, I'm a very jealous for Zion. So describing that ac uh, attribute of or emotion of jealousy or saying God is angry. And this is one that I'm still thinking about whether or not, you know, God is really angry or is it just an emotion that we describe to God figuratively. I'm still thinking about that. You can give me your comments in the description box below. Does God have real emotions or is it just what we ascribe to him? I'm still thinking about that. Um, 
But yeah, uh, definitely being challenged in my uh, understanding of scripture. Okay. Then the next one is zoomorphism. It's very much like anthropomorphism, where anthropos means man. Now zoo means animals, right? So zoomorphism, ascribing uh, an animal characteristic to God. Um, for example, uh, Psalm 91 verse 4, God will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. So think of a bird taking his babies, you know, or, uh, under his uh, wings. And saying, God will protect you like that. And so um, God will cover you with his feathers. I'm not saying, God, you are like a, a bird. He's saying, God will cover you with his feathers. Almost as if God has feathers. But God doesn't. It's a describing of a human or an animal uh, characteristic to God. For us to understand. Or Job 16 verse 9. He gnashes his teeth at me. By the way, if you're finding value, will you please subscribe to our channel? It's really much appreciated. And also like our video so it can spread to more people. Let's now go to four figures of speech involving omission or suppression. So the first one there is ellipsis. So the definition is the omission of words that must be supplied to complete a sentence grammatically. So it's like words are just left out. Um, for example... Um, uh, in modern English, if, if you just speak, say the word private, right? It, it refers to private soldier in, in certain contexts, right? Or the 12 in the Bible refers to the 12 apostles. And so um, a, uh, it's the omission of words that must be supplied to complete the sentence. Then zygma, uh, the definition there is the joining of two nouns to one verb when logically only one of the nouns goes with a verb. For example, Luke 1 verse 64, his mouth was opened and his tongue. Literally, his mouth was opened and his tongue. Was your tongue also opened? No, your mouth was only opened. So the tongue goes in the mouth, but the, the grammar literally says your mouth was opened and your tongue. So that's figuratively, that's zygma. That, uh, and the NIV, therefore, more dynamic translation to make, try to make it understandable, said uh, your tongue was loosed. So his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed to make it more understandable for us. Next figure of speech um, is, um, is uh, aposiopesis. <laughs> I hope I'm saying it right. This is a, a sudden break in the sentence as if the speaker was not able to finish. Okay, so he, he, wonder, he couldn't finish his sentence. For example, Exodus 32 verse 32, If thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. King James Version, right? Uh, it's almost like he couldn't, didn't finish his thought. If thou wilt forgive their sin, what then? But then he interrupts himself. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. Another one. Uh, Ephesians 3, verse 1 to, to 2. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace. And, and then he, go, he never finishes that first thought. Of he's for the sake of you gentles, what for this reason? What do you want to say there? So it's almost like he's interrupting himself there. Next one is rhetorical questions. Uh, this is, might be one that yeah, I've at least heard of this one before. Um, so the, the definition of this is a question asked without expecting a verbal answer in order to get the reader to answer in his mind and to think of the implications of the answer. So you're asking a question, you don't expect him to answer. Um, maybe because you write it, right? How can you expect a, a written answer from people that you're addressing? But you want them to think of the answer in their mind and the implications of that answer. For example, Genesis 18 verse 4, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Obviously, the question, the answer is no! And he shouts out and the implications of that is therefore trust him, trust him. Okay, another one. Romans 8 verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? The answer in your head is no one can be against us. That's obvious and therefore trust him. Um, so it's a rhetorical question. No, no answer is expected, but you're, you, you're bound to answer the question in your head and think of the implications. Now the next one is four figures of speech involving overstatement or understatement. So first one there is a hyperbole. Um, think of a hyperbole, right? A big stadium, right? Big. You're making something bigger than it really is. Overstatement. A deliberate exaggeration in which more is said than literally meant in order to add emphasis. Okay, so this is not 
uh, lying. This is not, you know, adding a little bit more than what's really meant. This is ex deliberately exaggerating for the purpose of emphasis. This is figurative language. This is not an, an error in the Bible. For example, Deuteronomy 1 verse 28. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. That's not, it's not lying there. It's figurative language. It's trying to say how high it is. It's to heaven. Everyone knows it's not really up to heaven. It's just as high as you can think. Psalm 6 verse 6, Nasby. Every night I make my bed swim. So he's showing how much he's crying. Everyone knows he's not really making his bed swim. That's personification there as well, by, by the way, because bed swimming, right? But it's, it's also a hyperbole, exaggeration for the purpose of adding emphasis. Matthew 23, verse 24. Pharisees were straining out gnats and swallowing camels. Obviously, they were not straining out gnats and definitely not swallowing camels. So you see using overstatement there, a hyperbole for the purpose of adding emphasis. The next one there, next figure of speech involving overstatement or, or understatement is litotus. An understatement or negative statement to express aff affirmation. So you're saying something in the negative or you're understating something to show something positive. For example, a modern example, he is not a bad preacher. Not a bad preacher. You're, that's an understatement. If you want to say someone is a good preacher, you're saying, he's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, Acts 21, verse 39, Nasby, I'm a Jew, a citizen of no insignificant city. He's actually meaning a very significant city, right? He's a citizen of Rome, Paul's referring to. Also, Acts 12, verse 18, Nasby, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers. Okay, no small disturbance. That means there's a big disturbance. So it's, it's really an understatement there. The next one there, um, pleonasm. Pleonasm. That's uh, the repetition of words or adding of similar words, which in English might seem redundant. Okay, for us it's redundant. For us, which we say that's bad writing, but for them it was figurative uh, language and used purposefully. Job 42 verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. That, for we would say that's redundant, right? You're just, you know, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Saying three things, you can just say, I heard you. Um, but it's emphasizing by that repetition of words. Acts 2 verse 30, another one. God took an oath with an oath. Okay, NIV would just simplify it. God promised with an oath. But literally, God took an oath with an oath. That's uh, pleonasm, a repetition of words or adding of similar words. Um, which in English might seem redundant, but it's for the purpose of uh, making a point. Then the next one, there's irony. Now, there are two types of irony. The first one is verbal irony. The definition of that is it's a ridicule expressed indirectly in the form of a compliment. So you're ridiculing someone by complimenting them. Okay, it's, okay you, So often conveyed by the speaker's tone of voice, so that the hearers might know that irony is intended. Now, that might sometimes be hard to, for us to read the Bible, right? Because you don't hear that tone of voice. Uh, and often irony has, this verbal irony has some humor in it. Um, it's similar to sarcasm, although sarcasm is normally heavier, heavier in tone and intended to wound. For example, 2 Samuel 6 verse 20, Michael, David's wife speaking to David, said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. She was actually ridiculing him because David danced before the ark, right? Um, and so David didn't care what people thought. He thought, God is great. I'm dancing before God. But Michael's, uh, his wife uh, thought, man, that's, um, you know, um, making himself lowly. That's uh, humiliating. And so how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. But actually, it's a ridicule. So that's a verbal irony there. Uh, also, 1 Kings 18, verse 27, Elijah to the Baal prophets, shout louder, surely he is a God. So you can hear that tone of voice, right, that I'm also adding there. Um, it's a little bit humoristic, um, and um, the opposite is meant, right? He's not a God. Uh, it doesn't help if you shout louder, but go ahead. Um, Job 12, verse 2, Job 2, is 3, 3, 3 friends, doubtless wisdom will die with you. <laughs> it's so funny, right? So saying, oh, you guys are so wise, right? So that's a verbal irony. Um, now, there's also something called a dramatic irony. Uh, the definition of that is a situation which is the opposite of what is expected or what is appropriate. So now it's not verbal, it's a situation. 
in which the opposite happened of what is expected or appropriate. For example, Job lived a godly life, but then calamity struck. Strike. And so that's an irony. That's a dramatic irony. Um, Elihu, the youngest of Job, uh, and his three friends seemingly has more insight in a certain matter. Or the reasons have, or another uh, time of uh, dramatic irony, the readers readers have more information than the characters. So the, the characters expected this, but the readers already know the end of the story, and so they know what to expect, and it's a little bit funny as well. And that's a dramatic irony. For example, John 11 verse 15, Caiaphas, the high priest, speaking, he said, you do, not, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And so, and then the next verse says, explains it for us. Um, he didn't know that he was referring to Christ dying for all the people of the world, right? And so Caiaphas didn't know what he was saying. So it's a little bit funny. It's a dramatic irony. Uh, the readers have more information than the characters do. We know the end. Esther 6 verse 6, oh, Esther, the book of Esther is full of dramatic irony. Xerxes said to Haman, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Right? And so Haman goes ahead and says, you know, give him all these great things. And because Haman thought the king is referring to himself, right? And Haman, in his head, planned to kill Mordecai with a humiliating death. And so while he's saying that the reader knows, oh my word, he's referring to Mordecai here, and Haman who wants to kill and humiliate Mordecai has, has to do that for Mordecai, all these great things, because Haman thought he's referring to himself. That's a dramatic irony, a little bit funny as well. Now there are two figures of speech involving inconsistency. The first one there is an oxymoron. Uh, the definition of that is combining contradictory terms, the combination of uh, contradictory terms for, from the Greek word oxys means sharp and morus stupid right so sharp stupid that's what the word oxymoron means sharp stupid right morus right it sounds like moron okay for a modern English example sweet sorrow original copy right those are uh, oxymorons really um, Nasby uh, Acts 2 verse 24 the birth pangs of death right birth pangs has the idea of life the birth pangs of death so that's an oxymoron Philippians 3 verse 19, um, and many times that's um, in the Christian life, right? Uh, it's really an oxymoron. They glory in their shame, okay? They glory in their shame. Well, oh, unbelievers do. But Romans 12 verse 1, we are to call to be living sacrifices, oxymoron there. Then the next one, there's a paradox. Uh, the definition of that is something absurd or contrary to popular opinion. For example, Mark 8 verse 35, whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. So that's absurd. That's contrary to, to what people would expect and to popular opinion. You must lose your life to save it. That's a paradox. Christian life is full of that as well. And then the last two figures of speech involving sound. First of all, we have paranomasia. That is using same words or similar sounding words to suggest different meanings. Sometimes we call that a play on words or a pun, okay? Uh, for example, Matthew 8, verse 22. Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Okay, so dead is used in two different ways in this verse, right? So first of all, um, the, let the spiritual dead bury their physical dead, right? Um, and so it's a play on word. Dead has two meanings uh, used, but it's used similarly, okay? Or Michael 1, verse 10 to 15. People at Beth Ophra had to roll in dust. Ophra also means dust. So people at Beth dust must roll in dust. So that's a little bit of plain words here. Also 2 Samuel 7, David wants to build God a house, temple, but God will build the house of David. And the second time it's used is the dynasty, the, the, the kingdom of David, right? Also Isaiah 5 verse 7, God looked for justice, misspot, but he saw Bloodshed, mispo, and instead of righteousness, sidaka, there was distress, siaka. Okay, so there that play on words, similar sounding words, right? So note alliteration and assonance also fall into this category. For example, Philippians two verse fifteen, blameless, pure, and without fault. In Greek, it's asymptoi akeraoi anoma. So that assonance, all three of those words, really starting with the Greek alpha. Okay, and then the last figure of speech involving sound is onomatopoeia. Okay, and the definition of that is when a word's sound gives meaning. Okay, modern English example, 
boom, buzz, click, hiss, pow, roar, tick tock. So that word brings to your ears the sound that it is making. And now uh, this is a little bit harder one because obviously we tr the Bible is translated into English, but um, the word jo in, in Job 9 verse 26, the word that is translated swoop there in the Nasby, in Hebrew it's literally the word tus, which sounds like an eagle sweeping down to catch its prey. So that word sweep is the word tus, um, tus, it sweeps down. Okay, so that's a, a, a figure of speech involving sound. Right, that, that's all of them. I'm going to place a link there to, uh, to the playlist of this great book. If you want to get more insight on how to study the Bible more effectively, how to get more riches from the Bible, and just click on that link and take you to the playlist, and then you choose which video you want to look in this book, which chapter, and maybe you just go through the whole playlist to, to benefit from it. Thank you for watching. God bless.